Hi everyone! Thanks for tuning in for our first episode discussing Little Women. We covered a lot of topics and had a lot to say, so to make things a bit more manageable, we've broken down our discussion into three parts, and we'll be releasing the next two sections over the coming weeks. So look out for those, but for now, I hope you enjoy this episode, where we focus on adaptation as commentary, Louise May Alcott as pre-read text, and the delights of an ambiguous ending. Enjoy! Nice. Sorry, I do have my dog in the background, so hopefully he won't make too much noise. He's just sort of lying on the floor at the moment. There will be no Hugo slander on this recording. It'll be a nice little, little treat for everyone listening. Hi, Anna. Hi, Lily. Anna, why was the book so thick? I don't know, Lily, why was the book so <laughs> thick? <laughs> that sounds like it's gonna go. It's not going where you might think it is. Well, you see, it's a long story. <laughs> God. <laughs> Sorry, it did sound vaguely like a euphemism when I, like, that wasn't where I... <laughs> Hi, I'm Anna. I'm Lily. And this is Liliana's pre-read media tape. The podcast where we analyse and discuss audience preconceptions of media from a queer feminist lens. Yeah. yeah. And today we'll be covering the only feminist family period drama ever written. As we can all agree, this is the universal women's experience that everyone can relate to 150 years old and it rings as true today as it did back in 18... 60? When was it written? Something like 18. 18, Published 1868, second book 1869. Well, there we go. We are, of course, talking about Louisa May Alcott's Little Women... And our main focus today will be on the 1994 film adaptation directed by um, Gillian Armstrong and the 2019 film adaptation directed and written by Greta Gerwig. Yay! Which is a movie we both fell in love with quite instantly, the 2019 version, I would say. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I had um, a lot of strong feelings watching the 2019 version. <laughs> and <laughs> and the reason why I think we thought this might be quite a good episode to cover is because when we were doing our episode on passing, the film passing, mm-hmm. we sort of brought it up as an example of thinking about like alternative endings and sort of how to adapt a kind of old trope or an old book um, into, for like a modern audience and looking specifically at how the 2019 version looks at its ending, which we're going to talk about in more detail but I think that's kind of where this sort of episode stemmed from, I guess. And in case you're a new listener and you see our title and you think, what is pre-read tech? So yeah, we talk about like kind of adaptations and adaptation theory, but our like specific focus and what we're going to be focusing on in relation to these adaptations of Little Women is this concept of a pre-read text, which is a term coined by YouTuber Rowan Ellis. And it's a kind of term that defines when you haven't engaged with the source material of a story or piece of media, but you have a strong sense of what it is about through interacting with various adaptations of that original material. That could be kind of film adaptations, musical adaptations, etc. And so this kind of cultural consciousness of story, the story, characters, images or concepts of this original piece of media, which may have very little or even nothing to do with the original source material, um, and instead all come from adaptations that have come after that original source material. So examples of this might be Treasure Island, potentially Lord of the Rings. Frankenstein. Frankenstein, a really good one. Dracula, Sherlock. kind of like very classic texts that are adapted and readapted many times. Those adaptations kind of create its own like meta-narrative around the text sometimes, which we're going to talk about more in relation to Little Women as well. Yeah. Again, a very sort of like classic, arguably part of the canon, although some people argue it's not part of canon. What is canon? Good question. Yes, we're going to bring all of that in. Also, this also a little bit relates to Death of the Author, which we're also going to talk about in relation to Little Women. How important is the original text and the original intent and everything? And where And where is that original text? Is it with this like original piece of material or is it like with kind of the events surrounding it the kind of things that inspired it like where do you kind of place that like originality as something we want to dig into today and then how do you explore that with adaptations coming in later on very good point we're going to focus again as we said on the on the book which technically is two books it depends on where it was Mm -hmm. published i think in england it was published as one book in America, originally, it was published as two books, which is Little Women and then Little Wives. And we're going to focus, as we said, on the 1994 version, which, in case you're wondering, that's the one with Venona Ryder, and the 2019 version, which is the one with Saoirse Ronan as Joe. And in preparation for this, I told you that I love the 90s version so much because mm. it's the one that I just randomly picked up from the library one day as a DVD when I was a teenager, <laughs> it's so interesting to me that 
the 2019 version was the first one that you watched, and that's the one that's not even in correct order. You have such a different experience yeah. of like your first time experiencing the story than I do, which is because you've not even seen it in <laughs> correct order for the first time. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because although like it's a story that I definitely heard a lot about before, I, mm -hmm. I definitely knew of Little Women. I sort of hadn't really, like I never read it as a child or had it read to me and I never watched the 90s version. So it's like, for me, it's not quite as beloved as like a lot, because I know like a lot of people really love that movie and it sort of like means quite a lot to them. Whereas for me, it was sort of like coming at it, that was the second version that I watched because the first one I watched was the 2019 version. I watched that in Christmas time this year re and really, really loved it. Um, but yeah, it's funny because it's sort of like, a kind of a response, I guess, to that original, or not to the original, but like to the 90s version, which we'll get, again, we'll talk, kind of talk about more about this later, a very much a reimagining of it, even while kind of staying true to the original story. But sort of, I don't know, I kind of feel like it does work. Most of it works very well for a first time viewing audience, even though it's sort of picking up on those threads of especially the 90s version. But on that note, what is what is the plot of Little Women? Could you could you give it give us some background? We're in 1860s Massachusetts. We're in a household comprising Abigail March, lovingly called Marmy, her four daughters, and their housekeeper try to enjoy Christmas despite them having lost their money. Mister March is off fighting for the Union Army, the North, in the Civil War. Meg and Joe, the two older daughters, support the family finances by working. Joe, the second eldest, works for their wealthy great aunt March in the hopes that Aunt March will one day take her to see Europe. On Christmas morning, the sisters decide to donate their luscious feast to a poor family of Germans called the Hummels. In the meantime, their rich neighbor, Mr. Lawrence, welcomes his orphan grandson, Lori. And at a dance, Lori and Joe meet. They become friends. He eventually joins the sisters in their plays that Joe writes and they perform in their attic. When Mr. March falls ill, Joe sells her hair to fund her mother's trip to Washington, and Meg gets closer to Lori's tutor, John, but her parents demand that she waits as they deem her too young to marry. John goes off to fight in the war, and Lori goes off to college. While her mother is gone, Beth goes to take care of the Hummels and ends up contracting scarlet fever, which weakens her heart. Lori comes home from college and proposes to Joe, who turns him down, and March chooses Amy over Joe to take to Europe huge scandal um and meg and john marry have twins and struggle with money joe goes to new york city writing stories for sensational newspapers meeting professor beer a former professor from definitely not germany um <laughs> laurie is hard we're gonna talk a bit more about yeah, yeah. um bears like origins later on but yeah, yeah sorry no 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 uh laurie is heartbroken and goes to europe with his grandfather meeting amy and falling for her but she dislikes his aimlessness beth takes a turn for the worse and joe returns home after a fight with professor bear beth dies and amy returns married to laurie shocking joe professor bear visits the march house and he and joe become a couple ending in heteronormative bliss for the marches with all remaining daughters as the editor says in the beginning married with children or dead <laughs> mermaid turns 60 that's the end i hadn't even thought about the fact that beth's death is that kind of married or dead dichotomy she, she falls directly into that which i hadn't even properly thought about although obviously yeah again we're going to talk a bit more about beth later but yeah thank you for that because obviously there are lots of adaptations and there's series adaptations that can go into a lot more detail on finer points of the book. And obviously in the 2019 adaptation, it kind of goes in non-chronological order. So our main focus for today is going to be why this story? Mm -hmm. Why does this story keep being remade? Yeah. Should this story keep being remade? What are, or is that a good question to ask even? Because you just said it's something that you knew of, even if you hadn't watched it before. Yeah. I never heard of it in Germany. I like, don't remember us in school talking about little women but then again why would an american story be german canon because i did tell you like, i read anne of green gables which is sort of similar time frame wise but very different story although also about poverty a lot so we were trying to focus on why does this book this story keep being remade why are there like, silent movies operas television anime series all of that that's a lot of adaptations as it turns yeah. out uh, one of the pieces of secondary literature we're going to reference quite a lot throughout is a life magazine um, about Little Women, the 2019 version of Little Women. However, it also kind of goes into detail on a lot of the other adaptations. But in that piece, the author or the writer says, um, every generation deserves its own Little Women. And that's something that we want to kind of question and reference throughout 
this episode as well. A little bit critical of that take. Yeah, kind of take a critical, more nuanced approach perhaps to this idea that every generation deserves its own little women, that this thing should keep being continually remade. But then also what it means to kind of continually remake something, kind of what that, how that changes for the audience, how that changes for the time. We're taking a critical lens to the Life magazine that dedicated itself to Little Women and the different adaptations of Little Women. But as we s said in the beginning, the reason we're covering this is because we love the 2019 movie and we really love this story. So we hope you're as excited to go along with us to dive into the criticisms of the different parts of the story and the characters and everything we're going to cover a lot today so yeah very excited that you're listening yes yeah. yes yeah, so we want to start off by just outlining why this story was so sensational at the time why this made such a big impact especially in american u.s literature and i think one of the key things and it's sort of referenced in the title is that according to the life article anyway this was the first book of US literature to treat teens as real people. Mm -hmm. Which is why it's called Little Women. The concept of a teenager just didn't exist at the time. Yeah, so it's sort of exploring this liminal phase between, you know, childhood and adulthood. That kind of divide. I think it's a line from the 90s movie, it may or may not be from the book. They had stepped over the divide that stood between childhood and all beyond. The pain of, of adolescence, taking on these responsibilities and moving and growing apart as a family and that hadn't been done in, in literature before, according to the Life article. And this was the first time that a work of fiction actually took those issues seriously. So you might even say that this could be a sort of originator of the genre of young adult teen fiction, which I kind of quite like the idea of. I think that's quite cool. Yeah. Yeah. Also, there's all girls. It has very specific focus on mm. growing pains for boys are as part of a lot of epic stories that part of life where you have to grow into being a man who takes charge or whatever that existed before but specifically focusing on girls yes. i don't know that there were a lot of books focusing on that also that it deals with death and it just allows it to be the focus of the story and it gives space for the girls to grieve beth the sister who spoiler is the one that dies quite famously in the story and it gives it space to have the sisters feel their emotions about that and and that's significant at the time because obviously back with like in the 19th century and before that, even in the March family, they had a lot of children. Like people would have a lot of children, especially people of a lower class would have more children because kind of child mortality rate was so high. Just in terms of kids, uh, people didn't have the privilege yeah. of focusing too much when their own children died, especially people who weren't rich didn't have the luxury of time to grieve their own kids because it was so common for kids to just not survive What's the word? Not even get to be a toddler age. That was so common. Not just Beth dies. Two of the Hummel babies also die. That's also part of it. That's just not the focus of the story. But it's quite common, especially for poor people, to just not have the hygiene and the food and the heat to actually keep children alive that long. And obviously medicine yeah. was a very different deal back then. It allows the family to actually grieve Beth. And that's, I guess, the first of its kind in a, sort, in a way for the book. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why at the time it was such a, a landmark book. At the time, this book was like a really, really big deal. It was widely read. Everyone was reading it. The Life article talks about how, um, you know, it wasn't just women, but also a lot of men were reading this book, boys, girls. And kind of since that time, this book has never been out of print, which is quite, it's quite a big deal. So like this book has kind of always, like since its inception, been really, really popular. And we kind of want to dig into the reasons why this popularity has prevailed. It's really impressive. We found the Life uh, magazine that completely devoted one issue to Little Women quite of interesting. And it's kind of wild because it felt to us a very neoliberal framing of why Little Women is important. It quoted a lot of cis, white, privileged, uh, heterosexual women as saying that this was the book that they found very inspiring and... Yeah. made them feel like they all could also be writers and they quoted Hillary Clinton but also Laura Bush which according to magazines like this I guess are the two sides of politics which is horrifying but <laughs> and we were sort of wondering how how feminist is it yeah because some of the discourse around this book is that pre-read text of this story is that it's a really feminist story like it has these four different sisters who are these different characters who they're different personalities one of the most exciting things about it is that the main character doesn't get married to the first guy, she, the neighbour. She doesn't make the expected match. 
And this has been like the feminist framing of the book, like a mainly female-led household. The father isn't around very much. There's like idea that this is a really, really feminist text that we kind of referred to earlier. I would argue that the reason that it's labeled as feminist now, though, it's because it's really easy to look back and look at how women used to be treated. Or like, oh my God, wasn't this so horrible? Instead of applying that attitude into how misogyny and patriarchy are destroying a lot of people's lives now. And but looking back at the sounds really critical, but I'm not critical in that sense of the original book. I mean, I'm more critical of the discourse now, but it's a very easy choice of the most common denominator as being something that is female centered, but also feels radical because it was radical at the time. But to praise it now, and to have that be the focus now just is not as progressive as people make it seem to be. Yeah. Yeah, it's that kind of like quite inoffensive, quite easy sort of liberal feminism that you draw from it. That I think interestingly, I feel like mm -hmm. at least maybe more in the 2019 adaptation, certainly to an extent in the 90s version, when you adapt something, you pull different things from it, you pull different messages from it that aren't just so you can make it more, I don't know if radical is quite the right word, but you can make it say something or speak to the times in a way that just doing, a, I don't know, that like just reading the book now wouldn't exactly do, perhaps. But I think it's possibly it's this framing of it as in the Life article as this very radical feminist text thing that's rubbed slightly wrong. This framing of it in this neoliberal lens as the feminist story that every generation deserves. That it's, yeah, the reasons that this is so popular is partly nothing particularly radical happens that we can really look at see now. All of the main cast are like white, thin women. No one even commits adultery. Yeah, yeah. And again, we'll talk more about criticisms of this text and what to do with those criticisms later on. But just to flag them up here, it's all of these things that kind of fit quite nicely into the status quo in a way. So you can kind of gesture to it as radical when actually in many ways yeah. you can just use this text to prop up and reproduce structures that exist now as well. Yeah. You can use it either an inspiration to actually make it progressive, right? Or you can do what they tended to do in this article, which is to praise it for something that just isn't something we should be thanking anyone for anymore. Mm. Right? Again, we're talking about a text that was written when women weren't allowed to vote, at least not in the United States, Germany, or Britain. So, yeah, I'm not thanking anyone for that. <laughs> <laughs> or at least, you know what I mean? I'm not thanking the system that I live in for that. The Lifetime article sort of leads us to our next point, which is that this is a story for tough times, because we're talking about a story that takes place during the Civil War, and it is about a family staying together and sticking together, and we sort of felt that was one of the positive, because it is always a good time, I would say, to watch whatever adaptation of this. It's always a good mood film, I would say, and the wholesomeness seems to be one of the reasons why this keeps being remade. Definitely. I think the March family are this very positive image. You know, they overcome adversity and they all come back to each other. By the end of the film, they've overcome their obstacles and lots of things personally for them have changed, even though like the outside structures haven't changed. So it's like they've overcome these difficult times, even while those structures remain in place. Watching this also at this heat, re-watching it in this heat was kind of funny because... I was just hoping that the Christmas imagery would leap off the screen because this is a Christmas movie. A lot of Christmas imagery, a lot of whiteness, both in the cast and just a lot of snow and very American looking type of Christianity, Christmas type stuff and this wholesomeness around feeling comfortable around a warm fire with your family. You have all, every single movie has that scene where everyone just gathers around Marmy and she hugs all of her girls and kisses yeah. all of them. Yeah. It's that kind of timeless, quote unquote, timeless, wholesome, universal white family together around the Christmas tree, celebrating each other and being charitable, giving away their breakfast and then being rewarded for giving away their breakfast. And it's this, their kind of goodness does get rewarded, even though obviously there's the tragedy of Beth. Of like Beth's death. They're a good family and they, in the end, come to a good conclusion, even though they have to face all of these trials. So yeah, it's that kind of homely, all-American kind of struggle, story of struggle through hard times, but they make it out and they, they're better off for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're going to talk about how the different movies use adaptation and how they speak to their contemporary audiences, respectively. I've watched the the series with, funny enough, Maya Hawk as Joe, 
what that was made in god 2018 maybe but i also they watched the 1933 one with katherine hepburn as joe and the 1949 one as well and we found it really interesting that um, in terms of feminism that the 1933 and the 1949 one had one f- screenwriter that was female so it's sarah mason and uh, victor herman which is her husband they were like a writing duo, and I do think it's interesting, at least from the very beginning, when it was a a talkie, a not silent movie, that it had female screenwriters attached to this. Yeah, and it's also interesting that I feel like there's always been kind of a tradition of having that carryover from an older adaptation of it to a newer one, because it was both, yeah, it's both in the 1933 and the 49 version um, that Sarah Y. Mason was was involved in both of those. And then specifically in the ones that we're talking about today, the 1994 version, I think was quite a big deal that it had an all theme top creative team. And they kind of wrote this original script for it, um, apart from the part. It's funny, in the Life article, they talk about how, oh, this was like an original script that these women like, wrote for the film specifically. But then there are still lines and things from the book that they use. But I mean, that kind of makes sense. But anyway... But there's this all-female top creative team. And then in the 2019 version, a lot of the creative team, the producers of that film, were also involved in the 94 version. And there's this through line that you see between the two. So the 2019 is kind of this kind of almost continuation of the 94 version of saying different things, like saying things they couldn't say or that they didn't think to say in the 94 version. And then a continuation of continuing this conversation through this adaptation, which I think is quite interesting. Like building upon each other as opposed to not just only responding to each other in terms of criticism, but also just this adaptation got to do this thing. Let's build upon that and do more for that character. Let's do more interesting things for that character. Let's take that bit of the plot of the book, which we didn't cover in this Mm -hmm. one. And yeah, put more time into that bit of the plot. Definitely. And I think that kind of brings us quite nicely into another bit of adaptation theory that I just want to bring in. So this is from Julie Sanders's adaptation and appropriation. And Sanders argues that, as André Vazine foretold as early as 2000, in the new convergence culture, texts or encounters may well be understood not in a linear or historicized hierarchy of original and adaptation, but rather in terms of a single work refracted through different art forms, all of which are conceivably perceived as equal in the eyes of the user. This piece of adaptation theory is very similar to this concept of pre-read text, about how when you're an audience member, you don't necessarily think of the original thing as the sort of most important, the original text is the most important text, viewing it as kind of your concept of this piece of media is filtered through all of these different adaptations. So when it says rather in terms of a single work refracted through different art forms, the different art forms are the adaptations? Mm-hmm. Yes, that's right. And so if we think about the 94 version, the 2019 version, it's kind of interesting how it's the, that 94 version is it's not the original text but it's also a very significant text in this journey of adaptations and so that's sort of, it's sort of pulling on that adaptation in a way that it's not necessarily pulling on the original source material it's not just like a kind of hierarchy where the original source material is the most important one in this relationship of adaptation in like source material it's like actually in its own way the 94 version is its own source material it feels like a nerdy fight where you're like well the book is actually a lot better yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so also Sanders talks about these three broad categories of adaptation that she takes from Deborah Cartmel, and these are transposition, commentary, and analogue. So the first one we want to talk about in relation to the Little Women films is this concept of transposition, which is it's kind of the most obvious thing when you think about the idea of adaptation. It's changing it between different mediums, so in this case, book to film. And I think we want to bring up this idea of book to film to look at how the book itself is presented within the films, or especially in the 2019 version, and kind of how yeah. that interacts, represents print culture, this idea of print and the materiality of print on screen. Because I think it's very safe to say that the 2019 version is very invested and very interested in books and the film's relationship to the, to the book and the, this relationship between film, book and life. And you can kind of see that in materiality of how this text is shown on screen. You have so many different scenes where you see in the very beginning, you see the gold being dusted off the cover. The first time you see Bear talking to Joe, he talks about how she has ink stains and it cannot only be for, it cannot only be for material. It cannot only be for money making. She must really desire have so much desire and love for writing as a yeah. thing. And you can see that in the way the film treats books as well. It had this idea, this yeah. love for the kind of care that goes into kind of showing each process of this book being made. So you said at the beginning yeah. of the film, 
we have this cover of Little Women by Louise May Alcott or L.A. Alcott. Oh, L.M. Alcott. Whereas at the end of the film, we have the front cover mm-hmm. that says by jo- or Josephine March. And you also have like mm-hmm. this beautiful process of this book being bound up and like printed on sheets of paper, the kind of gold plate. The pressing. Yeah, the sewing. All of these different elements pressing it together. And you get that montage. And so you have this physicality that very lovingly displayed on screen. You also have lots of other moments in the film, like uh, Amy burns the pages of Joe's manuscript. Oh, and when yeah, Joe burns point. her own manuscript, you see this this focus on the material and how I guess how important the material is because it, in this age before digitalized media, yeah. if if you burn that manuscript, that is gone. There are no hard, there are no backup copies. This physical thing is so important because it only exists in its this physical form. That's so interesting, sorry, because I rewatched the 94 one this morning and after Amy falls into the ice, they actually cuddle together in bed and they write down the story that they still remember from what Amy burned. And so the 94 one, you could argue, as opposed to the 2019 one, makes an argument for the fact that it's still in all of their brains. Yeah. The story still exists mentally somehow, but the material actual thing is burned, whereas the 2019 one is much more focused on showing you the material version of the book or if the, the story is being written by Joe. I just realized that this yeah. morning when I saw that. I was like, oh, they do try to resurrect the burnt book by what they still remember. Maybe it's like the 90s version is more interesting how the story relates to them. It's their story first and foremost, mm-hmm. whereas in the 2019 Ooh, yeah. version, as we'll talk a bit more about later, it's about what this book means as a physical thing in the world, at what it means as commercial property as well. Which is also very important because it's how the 2019 movie starts. Mm. It's her at the publishers. Yes. And how it ends as well. It's oh, I love, yes. the, way, I love yes. the way that film is structured. I yes. love it. Yes. And and I think it's interesting, this is a bit of a tangent, but the way the film presents its chronology, like in non-chronological order, and mixes up its different elements, you can kind of see it being chopped up like a book almost. When Jo is in her like final stages of writing her manuscript, when we're seeing that lovely montage towards the end of the film, you kind of see her rearranging the pages of her manuscript on the floor. This thing was never you know, one through line of a story, like it, it it can always be moved around in different ways, even in its original form. It was it never just came into the world fully formed. This thing took a lot of work and effort and could be shown in me- so many different ways, it could be moved around in many different ways. This adaptation, so true. this adaptation moves it around and changes it. And it, there was never just this original version that was unspoiled because it came from trying it in so many different ways. There's no like one pure version of the story, even when it's being produced and being made for for publishing. Again, such a love story for also maybe the analog mm. version of writing in yeah. a weird way, because it's a lot easier in quotation marks, but to have a physical page and move it around physically in the space in front of you, again, that's the materiality of it. You have the piece of paper that you actually move around, whereas if it was digital, you could still do that, but it just wouldn't be the same yeah. for her to have all of these pages written down and then just sort yeah. them for herself. There's something so fragile about it. It can just be gone in a puff of smoke if you burn it, but also something so satisfying about having that kind of physical page just there. I think something else that you've mentioned before when we've talked about this is how you think that this film shows a lot of respect for Joe as a writer by showing this materiality, by showing all these different stages of bookmaking. It shows that this respect for the craft, the work, the physical work that goes into creating a novel like this. There's so many movies now that are about the making of the inspiration behind something and you tend to only ever see this genius at work seeing something and then immediately putting it to page and then there's a book. I didn't realize this until we started discussing these films because... I the montage we talked about like this a training montage in like it's such... sports films. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's such a montage. But I really love it though because it's like you have candle wick and then it's at the top and then it's at the bottom yeah. and so it's like you no know, time has passed. And you see, you know, it's n- daytime, it's nighttime, and then kind of going back to that the idea of the work that it takes to write this book because when you're watching a film, it's you can't just. You have to sort of visually represent this thing unless you're just telling us that it's really difficult to write a book or whatever, which is potentially quite a little boring. You you have to show it in some way. You know, you see her having to like change hands with her pen because she's been writing so much with one hand. A good way of showing like how there's a lot of effort. Like one hand is cramping up. She's like, oh, my hand is now in pain. I have to like use the other hand. Physically how it affects her. And then she's falling asleep as she's writing and then kind of going back to it. 
yeah, I think it does a good job of showing that, that it's not just pure genius, it's also a lot of work that goes into this thing as well. Yeah. Also because you don't just see her writing a couple of scenes, you see her writing all the time. You also see writing as not just something that's displayed, which again is a very 90s thing. It's a very millennial to teach children that, that the point is to find your talent. Whereas the 2019 version seems to be a lot more about this is a skill you got to develop. Mm. She's talented and all that, but this is a skill. And you see her writing all the time. And that's why I also love the 2019 one in terms of just showing how much work it is to write a book. Because again, you don't just see her writing a book and then it's finished. You see her working on it over and over and over again. You see you see the editing process, not just from the publisher, like crossing out entire pages. Also her just getting rid of stuff and just redoing things. It really shows, again, you can tell that this was written by a, a writer-director yeah. because... You can tell this is done by someone who knows that it's hard to write something. Yeah. But it's sort of like the work that Joe puts into her book, there's so much more work that she puts into her book than that there is like work that's shown to go into her relationship with Bea. Because <laughs> Because there's a whole thing where, like, Gerwig has said that this adaptation is a love story between a girl and her book. It's interesting because it's not just that it's a love that's going on here, but it's like a love that you have to work for. And there's work going into this relationship that you see in a lot more detail than Bea, which we're going to talk more about Bea <laughs> and his and Joe's relationship later. <laughs> we're now going to jump into Alcott as pre-read yes. text. Because I think, yeah, I think talking about Joe as a writer, yeah, it kind of leads into that idea of Alcott as a writer herself. This is a kind of love letter to the writing process. And also that parallel between the written word and uh, life and art and the parallels that we see within the film that show this as well. Again, we talked about the opening sequence that shows that is the front cover of the book Little Woman by Louise May Alcott. And then the end title page that is Little Woman by Joe March. It's these two people are parallel figures in this film, but also very much so in the discourse surrounding Little Women. Which is Sorry. the pre read text, yeah. As you may or may not know, the very popular or accepted way to read Little Women is as a kind of semi-autobiographical text, by by Alcott's own life experiences, and especially by her family members. A lot of stuff that isn't necessarily even in the book. As a result of that, whenever they adapt it, they tend to use stuff that Alcott said in real life, or wrote in real life in like letters, yeah. and they put that into adaptations for yeah. Joe, the mm -hmm. character. So for example, Alcott was a feminist. She believed in the women's right to vote, for example. Yeah. She also said, I like to help women help themselves, which I thought was really interesting because to me, it sounds very American, yeah. very individualistic, yeah. very libertarian, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps type stuff. There is definitely some truth in Alcott being... I don't know, it's difficult, to, but I think there is a, that's definitely a case to be made that you can't really read Little Women without reading Alcott in there somewhere. Because this story is very much based around her family members and or you can read a lot of her, like you were saying, her feminism and also her autobiography into this book. If you look at the siblings, they're very much, we'll talk more about the siblings as like characters later, very much based on her own personal relationships to her sisters or from what we can gather anyway, representations of her sisters, her sister. So Beth, who I think was Elizabeth in real life who was her sister who died when she was 22, I want to say. Beth was 22, yeah. Also her father, who was quite an absent figure and left to go fight in the war, was very idealistic, but not terribly there for his children, which is very apparent, at least in the adaptations that you see. Mr. March just isn't, isn't around for most of the story. He's just not there. That's why a lot of the stuff tends to sort of be the audience expectation that you see a version of Alcott on screen mm -hmm. tends to then also be supported by the screenwriter and the yeah. people who adapted. <gasps> yeah. The fact that she said help the young canoe, I don't know that that line is in the books. I think they it's, put it in the movie. They put it in the movie, yeah. And I think the fact as well that like Joe is like a writer and sort of is she's a writer, she's trying to like provide for her family by writing fiction. Um, like that is all kind of in Alcott's own biography and so it's all very easy to read Joe as like a stand-in self-insert almost figure for Alcott herself yeah there's also this idea that Alcott is oftentimes read as queer or trans or both because she personally also talked about not just not being interested in men that way in her life and and very much having those kind of emotions the way that they were being described as for women for the women in her life but not for men yeah i'll see if i can find the quote actually i'm more than half persuaded that i am a man's soul put by from some freak of nature into a woman's body because i have fallen in love with so many pretty girls and never once the least bit with any man yeah <laughs> <laughs> which <laughs> i would label this as queer <laughs> yeah 
I think that's kind of interesting because this is, I mean, you have the queer subtext in Joe often, but also you just, it always depends on how much the screenwriter or director wants to go there. Mm -hmm. And I feel like very often they don't. I mean, yes, you have Professor Bear as the character to not allow you to support it as much. But again, people have changed stuff in adaptations every single time. So you could go there if you wanted to. Yeah. I'm like, with all of this, this the fact that if you talk about Little Women, you kind of always, in the discourse that surrounds it, you're always talking about Louise May Alcott. And just thinking about it and looking at kind of how much her life influenced this work, it's very, it does make sense to read it in that way. To just jump into a bit of Death of the Author, I think in this case, in a way, Alcott's life itself does seem to be the original text that the adaptations could be read as almost an adaptation of um, Louise May Alcott's life. You can kind of read her life and her biography, especially in the way that films often like especially the 2019 version used a lot of Alcott's personal letters and um, her writings within the script itself in a way one of these many of the refracted texts of of adaptation and of this cultural consciousness surrounding the text so I keep saying I'm going to talk about death of the author and then I don't but what is death of the author so in around about 1967 this guy Roland Barthes said that there is no one meaning ascribed to a text there is no author-like creator of a text the meaning is in the mind of the reader and in the cultural milieu. A text can be unraveled kind of, he didn't say like a sock, but he said, you can kind of read, I think he said like like a stocking or something, but like you can see a text as like a sock. It's like you can unravel it in so many different ways, all of these different like interpretations and meanings of it. But when you unravel it, there is no foot inside that sock. That sock is empty. There is no one original meaning that the author is trying to impart towards you. That's not the point of reading a text, is just to like find this original meaning. You can't do that. There are so many different like things that will influence how you read a text. It's not about the author god. But in a way, but there are many things that challenge the idea that, that the author is completely dead, there is complete separation between the author and the reader. And I think Louise May Alcott and the women is one of those big indications of it's very difficult to separate this author and her text because partly just because of the way that the criticism around it has built up you can't really think about these two things and the way that it's been adapted you can't think of these two things as completely separate they always influence each other but it doesn't mean that there is still only one one interpretation of it though the idea of death of the author is also giving you as the audience a certain amount of agency how much of what is being said to you on a screen how much of that is still in your own brain? Currently, the most famous case is J.K. Rowling. How much can the author be ignored? Quidditch is a sport that people play, and they renamed it recently because they wanted to very clearly yeah. make a point. It's quad ball now, I think, right? And they kept the cue and called it quad ball, I think. I cannot stop laughing about the fact that they're willing to call themselves quad ballers. Um <laughs> I mean, I get the intention. I fully support it. That's not what I'm saying. But just, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is this, We do not have time for a JK Rowling tangent. How much, if you've read something, do you divorce it from its originator? Mm -hmm. And how much of it is your choice to make? That doesn't necessarily have to be about whether your politics are different from the author. I think one of the best examples is always songs to me. A song you listen to and means something to you about your own breakup, for example. Even if that song is about someone, I don't know, losing faith in something, it does, the song itself doesn't even necessarily have to be about a breakup. But in your own brain, it is. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of like death of the author. You don't care about the intention of the original songwriter. You get to sort of choose the degree, I guess. Yeah. Again, when you adapt something that's that old and has been remade so many times, and again, talking about pre-read text, how many people who have watched those movies have actually even read those books? Also, sometimes with the idea of the author that we can know or we can attribute author intentions to a text as well, which I think we'll talk more about later. What was Alcott's intention for Jo? Mm -hmm. Like not wanting to marry her off and being forced into marrying her off and how that's become part of the mythos of this text as well. One thing I did want to briefly talk talk about before we move on to talking about the adaptations themselves and how they've adapted the commentary of this text was this expectation of life writing when it comes to female authors and relating that to little women that is very important yeah so in this kind of era of the 19th century specifically towards the end of the 19th century but in this 1860s fits in with that time period as well there was that was and still is i think a kind of expectations that female authors are kind of writing from their own personal experience always mm -hmm. and that it's really condescending yeah and that you can always access a female author through their text 
which I get. So I've done a bit of research on done like a bit of studying around, especially turn of the century English writers. It relates quite well, but isn't exactly the same. But how? Uh, who was it? I think it was Bryony R- R- Randall talked about how often because there was this kind of expectation that female authors would write from experience, female authors would take like pen names and they'd deliberately try and distance themselves from their work and try and kind of disguise this relationship between themselves and their work as a form of protection from scrutiny and to disrupt this idea that they could be accessed as authors themselves through their work and disrupt this kind of expectation of life writing. I think that's just something I want to hold in mind when we're discussing Little Women, as much as the discourse around Little Women is to do with Louisa May Alcott has an author and how her life inspired it. And as much as I think that is an element of it, I think it's just good to be cautious of presuming that we have direct access to an author and they don't change stuff through their works, or that we should necessarily believe that we can know Alcott's intentions, even though we have para materials around this work as well questioning that idea that we can and should expect to know this author through her writing, if that makes sense. Which makes it hard for queer audiences because we like to <laughs> we like to insert ourselves and assume, especially when people who are literally dead, yeah. you just cannot ask and you cannot... It is invasive to assume. Yeah. I believe that Alcott is explicit enough about her own understanding of gender and sexuality. <laughs> Yeah, and I think when it comes to adapting something like this, I think it makes sense. Again, it's another reason why I like the ending of the 2019 version is the sort of ambiguity of it. It's not nailing down, you must interpret it in this way and you must read it as Elcott was queer and then that means Joe is queer and therefore you must read Mm -hmm. it in this way. We're leaving space for that and we're making it very possible and available as a reading and inviting you to read it in that way. But we're also not demanding that we know the author and that we know we know the one interpretation of this text that is the correct one lending giving respect for that interpretation and giving it the space to exist as well yeah but yeah it allows you as the audience again agency yeah yeah (laughs) doesn't have to be the heteronormative one it doesn't have to be this one it can be what it is in your head yeah yeah as we're jumping to thinking about the kind of commentaries and what the adaptations are kind of trying to say in their interpretation of the original source material I thought we could just jump into thinking about this second category of adaptation that we might want to consider. So again, coming from Deborah Cartmel puts forward this category of commentary as well. And um, according to Sanders, this is achieved most often by offering a revised point of view from the original, um, adding hypothetical motivation or voicing what the text silences or marginalises. Yet adaptation can also continue a simpler attempt to make text relevant or easily comprehensible to new audiences and readerships via the process of approximation and updating. So again, it's both this idea of remaining relevant to kind of a modern audience, but also how you interact with that original source material, but how you can pick up on points that that source material has raised and then highlighting them further and choosing to focus on stories within that. Or or things that it doesn't talk about, like again, silences or marginalises. So you might think about people who've looked at the character of Caliban in The Tempest and saying like, okay, what's Caliban's story? What is it not telling us about why he is the way he is? Like kind of post-colonial reinterpretations of texts. Sorry, off on a tangent now. Let's get back to Little (laughs) Women. Yeah, of course. Oh, I'm just like always back to. I did a shake an adapting Shakespeare module, which is why <laughs> whenever I'm talking about adaptation theory, I'm always like, and in relation to Shakespeare, because that's where I learned about it. Would it be too simplistic to say that the commentary is literally commenting on the original work when it's adapting? Or I think yeah, I think well, no, I don't think that's too simplistic. I think I think that's one thing that's happening. I think mm-hmm. again, there's multiple different forms of adaptation, and so yeah, whenever you remake a text, you're choosing the part of the te- the original text that you think is most important and kind of by virtue of that you are giving us a commentary on wh- whoever the creators are on like they think is important about the text and what they think should be highlighted in it whether that be something that's already there and that they're pulling out more whether that be oh I kind of want to stay true to the original plot of the story whether they're pulling they're adding different things like in the 2019 version Gerwig kind of adds in this element of doubt in Joe, which isn't there in the original text, but that she decides to add in and she adds gives us this alternative ending. She also gives us a lot more with Amy as a character and where her motivations come from. Yes. Without reducing her to villain status, but we're gonna talk about that later. Yes. Um and then one other things that adaptations also do, again according to Sanders, is that they respond to social struggle and political power and to acts of historical consciousness. Okay, so I that was Robert Weiman. So in relation to little women 
again, this idea that there's an adaptation response to contemporary social and political circumstances that's kind of reflected in the feminism that these two different films represent. How they choose to adapt that material sort of reflects the kind of feminism of the 90s and the feminism of 2019. Yeah. And how that kind of makes the story more appealing to that audience of that time period. I do wonder about that. I wish I knew more about the mainstream reaction. I wish I would know more people who saw the 90s one at the time whilst being teenagers themselves mm. um, because it felt very feminist in a way where I just imagine a lot of people rolled their eyes at at the time whereas now mm. it sort of doesn't feel preachy because it just feels like Marmy just making very basic <laughs> statements about you know like yeah it's fine for you to want to be admired but you should still maybe more be concerned with how you conduct yourself yeah I maybe this is just my very condescending view of the 90s but I just assumed that people were just rolling their eyes at that and going like Ugh, feminism. I wonder, I genuinely yeah. wonder how that was yeah. perceived at the time because it's quite explicit about those type of things that Marmy says in the 90s. Yeah, no, definitely. I think a clear difference between the 90s version and the 2019 version is kind of the way they talk about feminist issues. Or I guess so in the 90s version, I'd say that it talks more about women's political rights and the right to an education. Or well, those are things that it talks about explicitly. It's still got the marriage plot lines and domestic interpersonal storylines, but it makes a point of adding in very explicit references to women's legal, political, and educational rights. I think something that the Life article mentions is that this version, compared to especially the 2019 version, the 90s version, they wrote an original screenplay. Although they use lines from the original, you know, they added in parts that they chose to add in as well from Alcott's life were her suffragism and her own political stances they chose to incorporate into into the film, which again shows that interesting interplay between original text and author's life bouncing around as that original dark point. How these things either were absent in the book or present in this other paratextual material would then brought to the fore in the 90s version for a particular, I guess, feminist stance that they were trying to make. Yeah. And one example we found of a very 90s feminist understanding, especially white feminist, is to mm-hmm. compare what black men go through and what white women go through and sort of equate those on one level. Because there's a scene in the 90s version where they sit in the pub. Somewhere. <laughs> after they've gone out. Joe and Bear and then some of Bear's friends or colleagues. Or, I think they're playing cards. And they're all kind of sat around discussing politics as men do. Yeah. They talk about the constitution and then someone says that denies the basic rights of citizenship to women and black people. And then they talk about how the 15th Amendment was just passed and black men can vote Charles. <laughs> um, then they argue that women haven't made it that far yet because they cannot vote yet. It's a very reductive way of looking. I mean... This is a whole, I could talk about this for like six hours. Again, especially if you're talking about this in the backdrop of the Civil War, to equate those things is the same. Or even like mm-hmm. making a leap and saying, well, black men can vote now, but women can't, is completely dismissing black women entirely in this conversation. Mm. And it just sort of reminded yeah. me of a lot of 90s movies. One of the movies I watched for class once was Chia Jane. And they also had a scene where a black soldier talked to the main character and was like, listen, it wasn't easy for me, essentially, when I got to the army, like people were really discriminatory towards me, too. You will get there. Yeah, which is not to say that people can't hold solidarity and things. Kind of equating two very different experiences is quite a reductive thing to do, especially in a film like this, which does centre female experience. Yeah. By saying like, these two things are the same. They're very much not the same. Yeah. Not in that period and not now. I just thought that was interesting because I forgot about this, but Freedmen are also mentioned by John Brooke in the 90s mm. version, which I completely forgot because no joke, he says, you know, Freedmen, and then it cuts to someone walk. I think it's Amy asking Meg, what were you talking to Mr. Brooke about? This discussion on racism and the war completely gets overshadowed by someone talking about romance. Yeah, I just thought that was interesting. And it sort of feels a bit like quite almost memeable, mo- not memeable moments, but you know, like when it's like screen grab, mommy, women should be educated just like men should. I mostly remember that the teacher says to Amy that it's as, as useful to educate a girl as it is to educate a female cat. And then she sort of is like, I will withdraw my daughter from your school. But I now rewatching it. Why a female cat? What? <laughs> yeah, unlike male cats, which are much smarter. Yeah, um, And I think that's interesting in comparison to the 2019 version, 
which I think doesn't it doesn't go down the route quite so much of of making very explicit kind of statements about like feminist statements or whatever. It kind of goes down this more of a show don't tell. Let's explore this through characters kind of way. But I think also the 2019 version, rather than looking at political rights and education, looks more explicit or more specifically at women's domestic lives and agency within capitalism, and especially this focus on capital and in relation to women's lives. Yeah. It's also funny because the 90s one in the beginning says, we've fallen on temporary poverty, which is a really weird thing to say, because how do you know it's temporary? <laughs> That's true. Do you think that some riches are going to come in soon? You know there's an end to this? I mean, good That's for funny. you. But I think, isn't there that whole thing where middle class people will think that when there's less money around, some money is a sign of more money to come. Ooh. More money will eventually arrive. Whereas working class culture is more, you have money now, that's just money now, like that's no guarantee there will be money later. We're not poor people actually, so this is just like a temporary poverty. Like our identity is middle class, so this is only a temporary poverty. Things will get better. Yeah. So when interviewed about this movie, Greta Gerwig said that she always thought about how Virginia Woolf was often asked, why are there no great female writers? And... Virginia Woolf would always respond with that that's not the right question. The question is why have women always been poor? And Gerwig talked about how because the book starts with them talking about how Christmas isn't Christmas without presents. The whole book from the beginning is always centered around money and that was super important to her to talk about when it comes to and write about when she was adapting this. And also Alcott was someone who wrote not just out of love, but also out of necessity. This is how she fed her family. A lot of male writers had more freedom to explore this as an art form versus as something to yeah. make money with. And that's something that is very much expressed within the film. That scene between Laurie and Amy, yeah, when they're talking about marriage and... When they talk about the idea of falling in love and... She says, I don't think it's just something that happens to a woman. And Laurie says, well, I think the poets might disagree. And then Amy says, well, I'm not a poet. I'm just a woman. It's expanding upon that. It's not just about art in that sense. It's even love is a choice of capital. Right? It's more influenced by money. Laurie, I think, is a really good example of art and capitalism because he wants to write an opera with him and himself at the center of it. Explore art where the muse takes him, essentially. Yeah. And whereas Amy is more interested in perfecting her talent as a painter in order for maybe being one of the greatest. She says that I want to be great or nothing. She also looks at this as like, then what's the point of her pursuing this if she's not going to be great because then she won't be able to feed her family this way and she might as well then get married, become, yeah. as she puts puts it become an ornament to society which again is a freedom that she doesn't have but Laurie very much does yeah exactly she doesn't have the luxury of being mediocre as an artist or even just a very good but not the brilliant artist because of her social status at the time and the fact that she's always considered so vain she sees her beauty as something that she can use for her advantage in terms of marriage but again it's something that's always depicted as something that makes her negative vain as opposed to just being practical about not being able to really have a job that would make enough money for her to feed her family yeah i think there's always an irony as well that in the film and in just the story itself it's joe like it's seen as taking a financial risk writing about domestic struggles of women uh, which kind of makes sense but actually in real life alcott didn't really want to write this book about the domestic lives of women she was commissioned to do that and did it almost begrudgingly according to the life article and writings that we have of her at the time which is interesting because even in the 90s version professor he sort of says i don't want to be your teacher but again this idea of writing what do you want is a very privileged position if yeah exactly this idea that you should just make art for art's sake isn't something that everyone can do and again i think there's that prejudice against especially women's writing as something if, if you're just writing for the money then that means that what you're making isn't art if it's all about the money selling out then it's just a money grab but actually seeing that in context and, and i think it is something the film explores in a nuanced way although it condemns joe for writing bear condemns joe for writing sensationalist fiction to just make money it's also her book is still even the book that she comes to write that's her it kind of means more to her is more about domestic struggle the finances of that are still very important and her assertion of her financial not responsibility but rights i guess over and power over her intellectual property 
I like something that's quite important. The copyright. Exactly, the copyright. When she's having that, because in contrast to her first conversation with the publisher, where she isn't using her real name. Not even an, a nom de plume. She's just saying, uh, by no one, it's anonymous. By no one. It's also not by me, it's by my friend. Yeah. <laughs> and and then when he's like, we usually pay 25 to 30 for this, for things of this sort. I'll give For this, I'll give you 20. And she's just like, yeah, sure, make the edits and go. That's obviously a decision that she feels she needs to make. But by the end of the book, of the book, of the film, when she's creating this book, it's she's kind of come into her own to have more of a sense of her own worth and the worth of her own work. A savviness to like, okay, how does this industry work? Actually, it's probably not a great idea to sell off the copyright to these books because that might be something I might want to have in terms of actually I might want to kind of have the financial power over this property which is something that it's like with marriage, women at the time didn't have that financial power. But Joe is able to assert that that's financial power over her novel by asserting that no, she will keep the copyright, actually. And that actually she will have 6.6% of profit rather than just 5% of profit. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, she negotiates and she bets on herself. Yeah. But again, even in that, she has enough freedom to do that because it's about whether she gets more money up front yes. or in the long term. And that also is a thing of, am I starving now? Mm. Because if she was starving now, this wouldn't be an option because she would then have to sell the copyright. But yeah. I do love the scene so much, especially when she says something to effect of, I feel like the copyright should be something that is important. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I feel yeah. like this is important. I think I maybe should hold on to that. Yeah, yeah it starts and ends with money, even though it doesn't start the 2019 film, even though it doesn't start, it doesn't start where the book starts. So I'm saying I do think that that's really amazing. And again, something that not I don't want to self insert Gerwig here as well. But I do think that speaks to someone who makes their living telling stories. Mm. I think the ending of the 2019 version brings up that question of adaptation and commentary and interpretation. If you read the book, if you've watched all the other adaptations or seen one or two of them, I think the most striking thing to you in the 2019 version is always going to be even just the chronological changes, but also what she did with the ending. Yeah. especially between yeah. Joe and Professor Bear. And we wanted to talk more about the ending here because it is so fascinating what Gerwig decided to do here. Yeah, it sort of says a lot about interpretation and the value of adaptation and what it can bring to something and how an adaptation can draw on many different things, not just the original source material, but a selection of these previous adapted works in this cultural milieu that we've talked about. The traditional ending with him showing up either in the rain or the kiss in the rain, or you have him showing up in the snow. I think the 1933 shows up during snow. Um. <laughs> yeah, this is Bayer and Joe that we're talking about. Uh, sorry, yes. <laughs> showing up at the March's house in Massachusetts. And in the 2019 version you have, in case I'm hoping you have seen this, her sitting down at the publisher and talking about the ending and then you also see the ending being played mm -hmm. out but you're never quite sure whether it's real or did this take place in the book only did she actually end up with bear or did she only write that kind of ending in the book that she's writing within the book yeah i'm jumping around but the 90s version ends with like you said kissing in the rain my hands are empty they're not anymore not exactly cliche lines but maybe slightly cliche lines but very rom-com very happy ending these guys get together and that's the end. And yeah, like you said, in the 2019 version, it's sort of framed around the publisher and it shows you the traditional happy ending. And I, I, I do quite like how overblown rom com -y is in the 2019 version. It feels like a sort of reference to the 90s version as well as just like rom-coms in general with the running through the rainy train station. Yeah, like running through the airport. And the way that there's two... When they kiss, it's like <laughs> it cuts to behind them or something, and you because so you have the shot of them kissing twice, and so mm -hmm. it's very deliberately overblown, very sweet and cute. And also the swelling of the yeah. music building to the big kiss. Also the way that they deliver the line, "My hands are empty, they're not now." It's so over dramatic, so it does feel like a satire version almost. But it gives you as the audience, if you love rom coms, it just gives you that moment of the romance of them getting together, and it's beautiful and dramatic. And it also gives you like a commentary on those type of movies. Yeah. So I'm like, isn't this kind of ridiculous? Yeah, it's a bit kitschy. Also, does this fit Joe's uh, personality as being sort of someone who's very argumentative? Wouldn't they be having a different kind of conversation? 
in that moment but it's kind of beautiful in a way yeah. I love the ending I've talked to her about this before but I find it really impressive how Gerwig did this it could feel like as an audience is being made fun of for liking this kind of stuff but because it doesn't feel like she's making fun of romance or even rom-coms it's someone who's also appreciative of that form of storytelling I guess yeah definitely it's that whole how do you adapt a vaguely problematic trope from an old book and it sets it up in the very beginning if you have a female protagonist she has to either end up married or Mm -hmm. dead either works and i think that's the kind of really nice thing about this ending is that it gives you the traditional ending but it also in a way it subverts it on multiple levels even though it includes that married ending the fact that it also includes instead of like married or dead it's like married or married and happy or like single and happy and so it respects the original whilst also respecting reinterpretations of of that ending and i think we should talk a little bit about how where that alternative ending comes from first of all a subversion of the married or dead trope there's this pre-read text that joe shouldn't have gotten together with Bayer at the end and that it doesn't really make sense for them to be a match for example in i'll link this in the description it's in them article so according to this person for ages readers have been perplexed and disappointed that after all that joe ends up marrying a german intellectual named professor bear in alcott's sequel to the first novel and there's kind of always this sense criticism that alcott was pressured into giving joe a love interest and to marrying joe off at the end because of the whole like married or dead thing also because of the audience yes. yeah and i think it's interesting that that them article says that people feel like a bit upset that joe got that after saying that she wasn't going to marry she got married off because it, in a way one of the reasons why joe um alcott seemed to be pressured into giving joe to marrying Joe off wasn't just because of the publishers it was because of the audience and that you did this research I think that audience members would it's in the life article as well I mean it's kind of famous for the fact that Alcott was just after the first books told especially since she turned on Laurie is one of those plot lines that kind of famously always piss off the readers yeah. because readers tend to self-insert themselves and this is I've heard this from a lot of people including the showrunner of the series that was done on PBS People tend to self-insert themselves as Joe as well, mm. and then they fall in love with Lori, and then they get mad that she turns down Lori because the reader is like, no, I would marry Lori. Yeah. You don't get to turn down Lori. When the readers read the first book, they were super upset and no, 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 you have to marry Lori. And in order to sort of piss off, the readers Alcott decided to not only have Lori marry someone else, which again, in the 2019 version, the publisher says, why doesn't she marry the neighbor? And then Joe says, no, the neighbor marries her sister. She cannot marry him. Like, uh, like he's taken. And then decided to give almost like an, I think you said this, like a funny match, it says somewhere, yes. that doesn't quite work. And so to piss off the re- readers and being like, I'm the, pr- there's no death of the author here. I'm the author. I get to decide who Joe ends <laughs> up with. <laughs> And yeah, trolling the readers, which I will say I respect just being very protective of her own work. Yeah. And I think, yeah, definitely. (laughs) Because I think like my understanding going into Little Women before I'd done much research about it, but just like hearing the criticisms was that Alcott was this victim of being pressured into giving Joe a love interest. And that, oh, she she was this kind of like victim of patriarchy. Whereas I think the way that, I think partly the way the film shows it as this kind of pragmatic economic proposition. And also the way that the Life article kind of presents it as actually yeah like you were saying actually i get to choose what happens to my characters and i'm going to give her this funny match that like you just make what you will of that there is a kind of agency in that and an assertion and almost like a kind of fuck you to like her readers but in a sort of not in a complete fuck you kind of way but th- yeah, there's yeah. still that i still have power of my characters thank you very much kind of thing i'm sure at the time i imagine people probably wrote letters to the publisher i do imagine that the publisher also said this to her in terms of um so we've been getting letters <laughs> You know, that kind of, I do think the pressure did not only come from the fence. Not that you were saying that. I imagine that both of those things probably, I don't know, influenced each other into putting pressure on her in terms of that. And the fact that she stayed strong and was like, no, this is my decision. We've talked about this also in terms of television shows now. Well, the showrunners and the writers room just checks online discourse around series and will then change storylines in order to subvert what people think the story is going to be. And that's not necessarily a good decision. People don't necessarily have the best ideas online about something, especially if you're not done telling your story yet. Yeah. That doesn't mean people's assumption about where the story is going to go are going to be right or wrong. And you don't have to go the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe maybe the fact that you've been dropping hints at where a story is going to go and people have picked up on those hints. Yes. Like maybe that's a sign of good writing. It doesn't necessarily have to be that, oh, you've made it too obvious or whatever. Maybe it's that you've been actually laying the groundwork for this ending really well and that maybe you should just stick with that if you want your writing to be good 
I don't know. That's kind of neither here nor there with Little Women. I, it's not quite the same. Not quite the same. But <laughs> I think it is. I think important to, to be aware that fan influence and publishing influence on works is always or like exist for a very long time, and that the idea that fans pressuring authors to do things because of Twitter, like authors are a lot more available now to readers than they were back in 1868 but still that pressure still did exist and did influence how people wrote and how people responded to criticism. To go back to the kind of alternative ending in the 2019 Little Women, I think it's a really nice way of honouring different interpretations and using this discourse around the text and these different interpretations of the text, honouring these different things while also not asserting that there is any one way to read this text. I think in a way, especially the way that the, the 2019 version incorporates a lot of Elcott's own writings in there, I feel there is that sense that it wants to honour her original intentions. But I think y- it, you can also read it as, you know, it's not hammering in, it, it's not asserting that these were definitely her intentions, or that this is definitely the way that you have to read the text. And I think it could also be seen as a love letter to kind of fan interpretations of Joe as queer, and of fan interpretations that perhaps these characters, even outside of Alcott's original intention, that Joe should have remained single and that actually she could have had a very happy life without Bayer involved. And yeah, I just think that it showed that ambiguity is one of the really nice things that adaptations can do and that modern adaptations can do and is a really good way of adapting a text that has so many discourses around it and so many different things that people bring to it is to give that ambiguity at the end. I think it does it so nicely. Yeah, and it's just beautiful. I love it every single time. And again, it could, sorry, I'm repeating myself, but it could feel like such a slap in the face. Yeah. As a rom-com yeah. fan, it could feel like such a, you're stupid for wanting this, and you'll know this is so funny. Like, we can acknowledge as fans of something that something is so ridiculous. That's what it feels like. It feels like someone who has seen a lot of those scenes where the music swells yeah. up and the two come together, and then someone goes, my hands are <laughs> empty. <laughs> yeah, and it's everyone's, all the sisters are so excited about it as well. Yeah, they help her get ready, and it is, there's a lot of kind of joy in that moment. It doesn't feel like, and then Joe was on. Unha- Joe was forced to make this decision, and everybody. So there's still joy in this ending. If you choose to read that as the ending, that's fine. It feels like such a period drama version of that rom-com thing of someone get the car because I think it's Amy that's like get the carriage ready, Lori. We need the yeah. carriage. You just said airport yeah. uh, before when we were talking about this, but it is that thing of if we don't catch him now, he will be gone mm. forever. I mean, even more so back then than it would be in a modern rom-com. Because because people can take planes back. Yeah. Going to California in 1860s is a very different conversation <laughs> to get someone back because how are you going to find them? Yeah. Or, but yeah, I just, I think it's beautiful and I love it every single time, even though it's not real. Yeah. My interpretation is that that guy went to California. <laughs> And that's fine. Yeah. Do you also yeah. love the scenes where they dance in the dance hall? I see him more as a character who moved her along to a certain degree. Yeah. Let him be a manic pixie dream boy and then bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs>